Good morning. Um, not sure where the lighting. Well, let me see if I can change my camera to the other one. That's a lot better. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to have to spend a few minutes admitting people. So while we're doing that, I want to share something with you to read that relates to today. Uh, and I'm going to make it relevant. So, uh, hang on. so most of you know, for better or worse, most of you probably know who Taylor Swift is. So I'll just create a Dropbox transfer. Create transfer. Okay, copy link. All right, so for people that I've, oh, Charles can't get in. For people I've just let in, um, I'm just before we have, how many people do we have? We have less than 20. So I'm going to, this is weird. Sorry, I'm talking to myself, ignore me, I'm ranting. Okay, so if you have a look at the chat box, I've just put up a link there to a document I've shared. Um, download that. It's a, it's actually a PDF, but it's a screen cap of something I, I probably captured on an app. So the format um, looks like phone format. Um, it's probably about two minutes of reading. Just have a bit of a read of that. Um, I'm going to come back and talk about David Bowie for, for a few minutes um, relating to that because music. Um, what? um, if anybody knows Charlie Bennyworth, um, or you've got his contact details, let him know I keep admitting him and he keeps going back to the waiting room. So I don't know what's going on there. All right. So anyway, have a read of that little Dropbox thing. Um, and I will be back in a second. I'm just going to get some clean my glasses and wait until we get up into the mid 20s. So we're up to about 25. I'll start in a moment. Okay, well, let's start. So hopefully one or two of you have downloaded the, the link I've put in the chat to uh, the Taylor Swift example. Uh, let me also uh, give you a brief view and I'll just share the screen in a second. <coughs> give you a brief view. I'll close some up rubbish of um, things we used to do in ASR, which were spotlights on little links. Um, sorry, spotlights on particular issues. Uh, I send the link again. Yep, hang on. Got to work out how to do this. Ah, okay, thanks. Thanks, Humber. Okay, um, 
So just a few words about um, David Pullman and David Bond uh, and David uh, Bowie. Some of you may know David Bowie was a musician, um, but one of the things that David Bowie is famous for in the accounting world uh, and the finance world is Pullman bonds, but most commonly they're actually known as Bowie bonds, basically because, and, and the context we have this in, we used to talk about this um, in relation to securitization because the credit crunch that happened around the time of the general financial crisis was largely a result of a lot of people taking on risks through investing in financial instruments they didn't understand the risk of. So that was sort of my, my catch line for that. But um, the Bowie bond was something that, that David Pullman um, created for um, David Bowie. David Bowie was a musician. Um, the story I used to tell, which, which isn't true, is if you're a musician, especially you know, a pretty famous musician, hang on, Charles. Um, sorry, this is the person who keeps getting admitted to the waiting room. I keep admitting and waiting room. My apologies. That was just Charlie who's trying to get in. I can't admit him. So if anybody knows him, just... Okay. Um, so, you know, you're a musician. What's your problem? <clears throat> lots of alcohol, lots of drugs, lots of zzz, the other one. Uh, you're going to die early. The fundamental problem is if you're pretty famous and you've got a lot of music, um, you've got a huge back catalogue that is going to be generating you revenue for a long period of time through royalties as that music is played as that music is sold money keeps coming in problem is that money is pretty useless for you if you're dead <clears throat> so with david bowie and okay i want the money up front so david pullman this financier organized a way of securitizing um, david bowie's music uh, music royalties essentially by saying if you invest in this little company, which they created, the company will buy the rights to the royalties from David Bowie. And then these people who have invested in this company would be repaid for their investment by the dividends they get from the company. So they invested in the company, David Bowie got all the money up front. In other words, he got the present expected value of his royalties. And so instead of waiting to collect, he had a lot of money up front and these other people were collecting dividends as the royalties came into that special purpose company that was set up. Um, now, you know, I like saying that Bowie did this because he knew he was gonna die early, blah, blah, blah. Turns out he didn't die early, but more importantly, this is not why he really did it. Um, the reason David Bowie securitized his future royalties was because he was in the Taylor Swift example. Sorry, in a similar situation to Taylor Swift. So you've had a look at that link that I put up. Um, if, you have a, if you've had a look at the link that I put up, uh, Taylor Swift was in a similar situation where she had she had no right to royalties for the for her first few albums. Yeah, David Bowie was in the same situation somebody else owned the rights to his first few records when he was younger you know when you're a younger musician you don't have as much negotiating power so he didn't have a right to his earlier royalties and he actually wanted to buy back the rights to his earlier albums so that's why he securitized his future royalties he basically said to people i'm going to put all my royalties for the next 10 years from the music i currently have rights to into this company. You invest, you give me the money, and that way you'll be able to collect the royalties. What he did with that money was he bought back the rights to his original music from the people who had it. Okay. So these are known as <coughs> Bowie bonds quite often, or celebrity bonds. Um, but it's a securitization situation where, in, where you're essentially owning an intangible. You've got a financial instrument that gives you the right to create, sorry, to collect royalties. Okay. Uh, sort of a, an indirect introduction into intangibles. Okay. So let's shut that up.
And let's go to today's slides. Well, now this is what I would normally cover. Um, I had a few people talk to me um, by email after last week's classes saying Look, that these lectures are useful and I probably shouldn't, um, I shouldn't necessarily just make them brief, but I am cutting out a lot of the palaver that I usually put into them. Um, hang on, I'm just going to tell Charlie to stop trying to access that. Sorry about this, sometimes Zoom's a bit funny. If anybody else has problems being admitted, today it's just Charlie and I think I've admitted him about 20 or 30 times and he still will not come in. So I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about intangibles. What are intangibles? Why do we need to talk about them? Remember that the thing that, the, some of the things that I said um, last Wednesday, that all of the principles from day three are going to, all of the principles from property, plant and equipment are going to apply to intangibles. So the principles are going to be exactly the same. Revaluation, impairment, possibly depreciation. But the exact practice of those principles is going to be different, primarily because intangible assets have an issue with reliability of measurement. Okay. So remember what I said, I think a, a while back, I talked about the Coca-Cola example. Right, you've got a debit, you know some of it's advertising, you know some of it as an asset, um, but the only people who know for sure how much is an asset, how much is an expense are the managers. And at the margin, you can't necessarily trust them to get it right. Managers have an inherent bias um, for recording debits as assets rather than expenses. And remember, again, I wanna make the point once more, they don't go crazy, they don't just stick all the debits into assets. But at the margin where they have flexibility, where the auditor thinks, oh yeah, that's, that's a judgment call, um, they can do that. So the problem that we've got with intangibles is we know they exist. We know things like copyrights, rights to music, um, intellectual property, patents. We know those things exist. The problem is measuring them. <clears throat> it's hard to measure their value. Um, so as you're gonna see, when we do measure them, we're generally gonna measure cost if we can, because it's more reliable, we're not going to really pick up value. So definition, what is an asset? We got, we got this definition before. It's a resource that you control and it's got the potential to produce economic benefits. <coughs> you know, I never cough like this until I start lecturing. Maybe it's because I, I talk too loudly or not enough coffee. So that definition of assets applies to what we did on Wednesday and it applies to what we're going to talk about today. Where the difference is really come from is recognition. So when do you recognize? You know, what does recognize mean? Recognize means record, right? So recognize means record an asset or liability or revenue or whatever by doing debits and credits. So you're doing a journal entry, right? Accounting is accounting or financial reporting is actually two things. It's disclosing information and it's recording information. Now you can disclose information without recording it in the accounting system. So if when we see leases in a few weeks, <clears throat> there is additional information that needs to be disclosed in the notes to the accounts. Um, with intangibles, some, when you do impairment, there's additional information that's disclosed that you don't necessarily record. Let me jump ahead a, a week or two, <coughs> sorry, a day or two, and give you an example of a situation where something exists where we don't record it. Um, we're gonna look at contingent liabilities. I think that's tomorrow or Wednesday, I can't remember exactly. A contingent liability is something that you're pretty sure is a liability. Actually, the definition is broader but you can't record it because there are measurement issues. So if you can't record it, that means you can't do any debits or credits. However, the standard still requires you to provide additional information in the notes to the accounts, right? So accounting is not just about recording, 
It's about disclosing. Sometimes it's recording plus disclosing some extra stuff. Sometimes if you can't record it, you've got to disclose what the measurement issues are. So the fact that we've got an asset doesn't necessarily mean that it's recorded or recognized. <clears throat> so in order to recognize an asset, you've it's got to meet all the criteria, right? So it's got to be an asset and you've got to be able to come up with a reliable measure. Okay. I've talked a bit about Coca-Cola. Um, I used to, when I did these lectures, postgrads, and I had a three hour lecture, um, I used to talk about all these different examples of intangibles. But I think you've got a, a reasonable idea of an intangible is. Uh, it's anything from a brand name to a formula, you know, KFCs, 11, however many there are, secret herbs and spices, even the Coca-Cola formula. That's an intangible. It's something that you've developed through research activity. Um, it's probably, its value, its value is probably part of the brand. But you could argue the value of the formula is probably se separate to the brand. Um, and if any of you think that the formula for Coca-Cola doesn't matter, um, when you have a chance, Google the phrase classic Coke, C-O-K-E, um, because, oh, maybe 20 years ago now, Coca-Cola decided to come up with a new formula. They changed the taste and people stressed like crazy. Nobody liked, well, people wanted the old taste back. So then Coca-Cola bought in a thing called classic Coke, which was the old taste. And it turns out classic Coke outsold the new one. So, you know, eventually they got rid of the new formula. Hey, if you've got something, last thing you want to do is stuff with it. Okay, <clears throat> so remember the context um, of this subject. We're talking about incentives, we're talking about information, we're talking about regulation. So I just want to say a little bit about information content. Um, Mary Bath is an American accounting researcher. Um, she actually works uh, quite a bit with uh, the guy who's my PhD supervisor, Greg Clinch, who's down at Melbourne. And Mary Bath did a study over 20 years ago um, that looked at brand valuations. Now, you have to understand something before you, you understand. If you want to go away and read it, do it. But um, accounting research papers tend to be quite intense. Um, <clears throat> so American accounting standards are different from international standards. And one of the chief differences is that in American accounting standards, you do not recognize internally generated intangibles. So now you will see that generally we don't, but there are exceptions. And the exception is if you develop something like a book or a copyright or a patent or a formula or a recipe using a development process, you're actually allowed to recognize that. So research, not allowed to be recorded as an asset. I'll tell you why later, but, ex but development might be. Now in America, R&D is always an expense. So one of the cool things about going to international conferences is, um, you know, we, we who apply international standards often, often, well not often, sometimes look at um, how development is recorded on balance sheets and what, what the value of that information is. And the Americans are always interested in this because this is different from what they do. Um, so where do you get values of brand? That, that if you look at brand values, if you just Google that, um, there are a few outfits that come up with what they think the values of, of key international brands are. What Mary Bath basically did was looked at, looked at disclosure in other places in the balance sheet that gave you a feeling for um, what the value of a brand was. So they can't disclose brand assets, but you can get the information from elsewhere. And basically the way accounting academics ask the question, does something make a difference? Does it, does it provide information content? I mean, there's the way Ball and Brown did it when we looked at that earlier. Um, but another way of doing this is asking the question, run a regression, so estimate a regression model, where the market value of the company is a function of net assets, right? So when you run a regression, if you remember doing this in high school stats, um, alpha plus uh, coefficient beta on NA plus a number of coefficient gamma on, on the information you're interested in. So let's say in, I, 
intangible assets that aren't disclosed. So is market value a function of net assets? Of course it is. There's a correlation between the accountant's measure of shareholders equity and the market value. Although, as I pointed out, I think um, when we talked about impairment last time, you know, generally market value is bigger than, than net assets. But if you put other information in, does this other information help you, does it help explain the value of this left-hand side variable? And if it does, that basically means that market value actually captures um, this value, even though it's not disclosed in the accounting, on the balance sheet or on the income statement. So Mary was basically asking the question, do share prices look as if they're incorporating intangible assets, um, the information from intangible assets? And it turns out they are, right? I don't, don't want to go through a whole research paper here because that could take a while, but if you're ever interested, go have a look at it. Um, and Charlie, welcome in. Finally, after about 30 times clicking, kicking admit, clicking admit you're in. Okay. Um, does, so do intangible assets have information value? Um, is there value in brands? I think most of you can argue that, you know, BHP, Commonwealth Bank, Woolies, maybe West Farmers to a point, the Qantas, all have brand value, right? The Qantas brand map means something. Um, the Commonwealth Bank brand means something. So as a general rule, as I said last time, you're going to find that the market capitalization, so the market value of the shares, is greater than the accountant's value of the shares. Now, remember when I first said that last time, that the main reason I gave you was accounting is conservative, right? You know, you invent something, you know, Pfizer invents a vaccine. Um, when does the share price record it? Whoa, straight away. When does accounting record it? it? Takes a lot longer. The revenue doesn't get recorded until you actually start earning it. So there are a bunch of reasons there's a difference between book value of equity and market cap of shares. <clears throat> One is that accounting is slow. But another reason is, if accounting doesn't record the brand name, the share price does impound the value of the brand name. Right, Qantas and the Commonwealth Bank are typical examples of that. Uh, Fortescue had a backward situation for a while there. With mining companies, it gets a little bit more interesting because uh, sometimes the company, in a sense, has negative value because of what's happened in the market. Sorry, the, the excess value is negative. But we can talk about that in another context. You know, I can, I can tell stories here, but that's, that's not what we have time for. So let's come back to incentives. What are your incentives to record something as an asset instead of as an expense? Remember that accounting numbers are used in debt contracts and management contracts. So managers are awarded based on profit. Profit's an accounting number. Uh, lenders manage risk, looking at things like the debt equity to ratio, ratio the times interest earned ratio. And these are all accounting numbers. Right, so if you are close to your debt, you know, let's say you've got a, a loan <coughs> and your loan says your debt's not allowed to be bigger than 30% of your equity or 30, bigger than 30% of your assets, but your liabilities are currently 29% of your assets. You're really close. In fact, even if you're not planning to take on another loan, you're a little bit scared because if you make a loss this year, your assets might go down and suddenly your debt might be more than 30% of your assets. So the closer your debt is to the allowable limit in your debt contracts, the more likely you are or the more motivation you have to manipulate your accounting numbers. And that applies in general, not just in relation to intangible assets. <coughs> okay, so let's talk about the accounting standards. WSB 138 covers intangibles. Um, I only list one standard here. There's, you know, there's some upfront stuff I need to give you. When we talk about intangibles in English, we talk about a whole bunch of different concepts. And I've you know, mentioned a few, capitalised value of royalties, brand names, patents, recipes. Um, when we talk about intangible assets, generally in English, we also include goodwill. So what's goodwill? Goodwill is that value, that intangible value that you have that you can't attribute to anything in particular. Um, let me give you an example. I used to go to a cafe in Burwood. It's not there anymore. It's been replaced by a Chinese tea shop. Bit of a shame because that cafe, when it was owned by the original owner, was 
it, it, the value of the business was a lot more than the value of the assets. In fact, the value of the assets of that cafe was actually pretty negligible. They had some furniture, they had admittedly a pretty expensive coffee machine, a few decorations and stuff, but that was it. The property was actually leased. But when the guy, um, Sal, sold it, it used to be called Cafe Marco, when Sal sold it, he actually made a lot of money on it. And most of the money was from the goodwill he had generated. So I don't know if you know Bellwood at all, but in just down from the station heading north, um, it was on a corner. So a lot of people were walking by as they were going to the station. More importantly, EDS had its office a block away. EDS was um, an IT outsourcing business. It's now part of IBM. And often, you know, there was not much room in their building to have meetings or maybe they wanted to get out. So often people from there would come to this cafe to have meetings. So it had a regular clientele. Um, service was really good. When I turned up, you know, they knew what I wanted. I always wanted a latte. They didn't, you know, they didn't even bother asking me. The latte came straight over. Um, but more importantly, their staff were very attentive. They weren't sort of talking amongst themselves. They were looking at you. As soon as you looked as if you wanted something, they came over and served you. So the reason that cafe had a lot of value was not because of physical assets. It was because of a whole bunch of other things that could not have been bought. Things like staff service, quality of the food, quality of the coffee, um, staff attentiveness, location, right? All of that stuff's goodwill. Now that's not because of a recipe. That's not because of any particular intellectual property. Goodwill is the most general type of intangible. It's the intangible you have when you're not sure what the source of value is. Right, so goodwill is that catch-all difference between the value of the business and the value of the stuff it's got recorded in its books. Why am I saying this? It's because it's the most general one, it's the hardest to reliably measure. So it is not covered by AASB 138. It's not listed in intangibles in 138. It is an intangible in English, but in accounting, it doesn't meet the definition of 138. Instead, Goodwill is defined in AASB 3, which is the standard for business acquisitions. Why? Because goodwill is so vague that the only time you're allowed to record it is if you buy it, because that's the only time you have a reliable measure for it. So, and you can't buy goodwill by itself, right? Goodwill attaches to a business. So AASB 3 says, hey, if you pay hundred bucks for a business, but the value of the assets is 93, Right, once you've assessed them and all that, the difference, the seven must be goodwill. So the only time you can record goodwill is if you buy it as part of a business. And so that's why the standard setters have said it's more appropriate for goodwill to be covered in AASB3 than in AASB138. So when people in English talk about intangibles, they usually include goodwill, but the accounting standards say AASB3 talks about goodwill, Double ASB 138 talks about all the others. Okay, I just wanted to tell you what the standards are covering. <clears throat> so what's an intangible under 138? It's a physical asset with, it's, sorry, it's an asset without physical substance. It's identifiable, right? So that means it's not goodwill because you know the source of the value, but with goodwill you don't. Goodwill you sort of might vaguely know. And it's non-monetary, right? Just to exclude things like accounts receivable. You know, somebody might freak out and say, well, hang on, accounts receivable isn't physical. Does that make it an intangible? Well, it's explicitly argued not to be. Um, why are monetary assets not even considered in intangibles? The whole point of AASB 138 is it's there to help you deal with accounting, with assets that have real measurement problems. Uh, you, you'd, you'd be pushing it to say that accounts receivable has a measurement problem. Right, it's not really in the same category of, you know, th th there's some weird shit going on, we're trying to measure it. Okay, <clears throat> what do we mean by identifiable? Identifiable means separable, you can sell it separately. And as a result, it has to arise from contractual legal rights. Um, <clears throat> now some 15 to 20 years ago, um, one of the British um, car making companies, and I can't remember which one it was. Oh, hang on. <clears throat> There were two that got sold to German companies. One of them was... Um, Rolls-Royce. 
Yeah, and one was Rolls Royce. What was the other one? I think Rolls Royce. Mini. Mini. Yeah. Okay. And so I'm I'm a little bit confused as to which one I'm thinking of. The Mini. The Mini was originally the Leyland, right? So the Mini Cooper, I think, is now made by BMW. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I think what happened with with the Mini, um, BMW BMW bought the brand, but or I might this might be Rolls Royce, it might be Mini. It's one of them, but I'm not sure which one. The company that bought it bought the brand, but they did not buy any of the factories, any of the staff. Um, they might have bought the design. I'm not sure. But really, they just bought the brand. And if you look at the Mini that's made by BMW, or the Mini Cooper, as they now call it, um, and you compare it to the original Leyland Minis, they're vaguely the same. But you look at them more closely, they're actually quite different. Um, it's more an issue of style than substance. So... <clears throat> That so it's one of those two companies, either Rolls Royce or Mini Cooper, uh, sorry, or Mini, when it got sold, all that got sold was the brand, none of the other crap. With the other one of the two, um, a factory and designs and things got sold as well. So it is possible to sell a brand by itself. It's extremely rare. You know, I had to go fishing for that, that example to find it. it. It's rare, but it does happen. So separable basically means you can sell it itself and sell it by itself. It's rare that it would happen, but I mean, usually you want to sell it with, um, you know, with the assets that go with it. I mean, who wants to start from scratch? Well, BMW sort of could because it has the skills to do that. And I would probably argue that the BMW Mini Cooper um, is probably technically a much better car than the old Leyland Mini. Uh, okay, so we know what intangibles are. We know what identifiable intangibles are. So let's talk about acquisition. Um, the general rule for acquisition is recognize it if, it if it meets the definition of an asset, right? So probably you're gonna have future economic benefits. Um, and it meets the recognition criteria. So the recognition criteria about probability, low uncertainty, right? That's saying there's low uncertainty about the asset means those future economic benefits are probable. And secondly, you can measure an attribute of the asset reliably. And if you're buying it, the attribute which you can measure most reliably is cost. So Generally, an intangible is always measured initially at cost. This applies to those that you buy from you buy externally. It also applies to the rare situation where you are allowed to record an internally generated intangible. Okay, and we'll talk about that a little later because some people walk away from this lecture thinking you're allowed to generate you're allowed to record internally generated intangibles. No. The rules are very strict. Only in certain rare circumstances are you allowed to do that. So intangibles are either going to be internally generated or separately acquired. So let's talk about separate acquisition first. Um, with separate acquisition, there's no problem with the measurement and the basic rules for recording costs are the same as with any other asset, right? So what's the cost of an asset? It's the cost of acquiring, so the actual purchase price, plus any cost of getting it ready for use. Or, or, you know, putting it in position. So if you're buying something like a taxi license, um, there might be a, a registration fee or a re-registration fee. Uh, let me be careful. When I say taxi license, I am not talking about the license for the motor vehicle, which is the taxi. I am talking about the license to operate a taxi service. So if you're crazy enough to want to run a taxi and give Uber exists, you're crazy enough to want to run a taxi in Sydney, you need to buy a bunch of things. You need to buy the right to operate a taxi from the state government. That's what we mean by taxi license. You also personally need to know how to drive a taxi or have someone who can. You also need to buy the car and license and register that, right? So registering or licensing the car is separate from the license to operate this business. Um, there are some businesses in Australia where you need a license to operate. You go to the US, which people talk about the land of the free, but I've, you know, I've got friends there. The US has got more red tape than a lot of places. People complain about Australia. Travel overseas a bit. Australia actually has some pretty light on regulation. Um, in some states in the US, if you want to be a hairdresser, you don't just need to finish a course. You actually need a license from the state. Okay, hairdressers, fair enough, because you use chemicals. I think in Georgia or Alabama, if you want to be an interior decorator, I would tell people where to put stuff or interior designer. You actually need a license. You need to apply for a license from the state. You can't just start doing the job. 
okay? Not something very common in Australia, more common in the US. Um, it used to be very common in India. India was referred to as the licensed Raj for a while. Um, Indian students can probably correct me on that, but not now because I'm probably out of date. Okay, so you acquire assets, costs, just like with any other asset, with inventory or, or machine, are the price, but all the costs of getting it ready for use. Um, so they're identifiable intangibles. What about goodwill? Well, as I said earlier, what's goodwill? Goodwill is the difference between the purchase price of the business that you're buying and the fair value of the identifiable assets that you're getting. Sorry, so PowerPoint keeps doing these lines. So if you buy a business, you've got to do a bunch of things first. And you're doing this as part of the negotiation. So this isn't anything new. You've got to say, what's the real fair value of all these assets? So I know this guy's got this asset recorded at cost of 100 bucks, but maybe its market price is 200, right? So what's the value of this asset? Are there any liabilities they have that they haven't got recorded, right? Remember that I did mention the example of a contingent liability. A liability isn't recorded because you can't measure it properly. The point is if you're buying it, measurement does become certain because you negotiate with the other guy, oh shit, this business has got this liability. I'm taking this liability on. I want a discount. And then you negotiate the discount on the purchase price. So implicitly you're valuing a contingent liability. So once you've made sure that all assets uh, are, once you're sure that you know the fair value of all the assets and you know the fair value of all the liabilities and you take the difference between those, that's the fair value of all the assets. If you are still paying more than the fair value of the assets, the difference by definition must be goodwill. It's that extra, it's that extra value that you can't, you know, point to a physical asset or a database or something and say that's what you're buying. So if the net fair value, sorry, so if the net fair value is less than the cost of acquisition, the difference is goodwill, that goes as a debit to goodwill. If the net fair value is greater than the cost of acquisition, then there's a missing credit and that credit just goes to income as a bargain purchase. And thank God the standard says that. Um, if you looked at the standard for doing this 15 years ago, this second part would have been really messy. Like you had to allocate it to different assets. We don't do that anymore. So don't look at any accounting books that are more than 15 years old. Okay, so we'll talk about separate acquisitions. Separate acquisitions are no brainer because the price has been negotiated. If there's an intangible there, you have explicitly worked out what its value is. You're paying 100 mil, but, but all the identifiable assets are uh, 70 mil, the difference is goodwill. As part of those identifiable assets, you might have said, oh, here's an intangible customer database. Here's an intangible brand name. The seller couldn't record them because they've created them themselves. But if you're buying it, you're explicitly thinking about what it's worth. As part of the purchase negotiation, you're putting a value on it. So you can reliably measure it. Right, so separate acquisition, no problem. You can record it. There's a few hoops to jump through, but you can record it. Where we get interesting is internally generated intangibles. So what do we mean? There's goodwill, which I've talked about. Now, goodwill is not to be recognized as an asset. And the reasons are pretty obvious, right? You know, identifiable intangibles like brand names are pretty hard to get a value on at the best of times. But at least you know, it's the Coca-Cola brand name, or it's this doctor's database, or it's this accountant's client list. At least you know what the source of value is. Goodwill, you can't separately value it. It's this extra value generated by the assets of the business that you can't really put a track on where it comes from. And it certainly doesn't meet the definition of AASB138. I mean, it's not separable. You can't sell goodwill separately. I mean, goodwill subsumes, sorry, good, not subsumes, what's the word? Uh, goodwill subsists in a combination of assets, right? So you can't really control it because you can't sell it separately. And you certainly can't measure it reliably. Oh yeah, you think your business's value has gone up by yeah, $20,000, but how do you really know? your guess is as good as mine, especially when there's a goodwill component, which, which is generally unique, right? I mean, I'm running a, let's say I'm running a Macca's in, in Stanmore and I'm running a Macca's in, in Burwood. 
um, those Maccas will have different McDonald's, by the way, for non-Australians. Those will have different values because they have different um, demographic, reg demographic regions, different socioeconomic customer area. You know, so, so these things tend to be unique. So goodwill, internally generated goodwill is not recorded. Research and development I'm gonna come back to. Um, brand names, etc. Now, if you look at the standard, let's just, no, I'm not gonna, oh, what the hell, I'll call up the standard. Um, open a browser. .au. The reason I wanna show you this is, um, when I first looked at the standard, I found it said brand names, something, something, etc. I found that really annoying because uh, I said, what the hell does that mean? So I'm just going to cut brand names. Uh, let's just go back. Okay. The, the thing that, that sucked to me with ASB138, it says, and this is subsequent expenditure, not acquisition, but the same sort of thing. Expenditure on brands, mastheads, publishing titles, customer lists, and items similar in substance is always recognised in profit loss. In other words, it's always expensed. It's never an asset. And, and you sort of hate it when people say things like similar, what does similar mean? I think at one stage they even say etc. Yeah, here's the actual operative paragraph. Items similar shall not be recognised as intangible assets if they're internally generated. What the hell does similar mean? How do I know the similar? Uh, customer list. This is an old standard, right? We mean customer database. Publishing titles. These things are quite different from each other. So what, what is similar? How, what do these things have in common that help us identify what is similar to that list? The thing that brands must, a masthead is the title of a newspaper. So like a newspaper brand or a magazine brand, publishing titles, customer databases. What do those things have in common? What those things have in common is that they are byproducts of normal business activity, right? Imagine how a customer database is generated. You either buy it, okay, separate acquisition, no problems, reliable measurement, or you generate it yourself. So now I'm sitting here on the phone, um, I'm answering customer queries, I'm making a sale to them. While I'm doing that, I'm updating the delivery address. I might be taking some notes um, about what they ordered. You know, probably I've got decent data analytics that help me sell additional stuff to them. Uh, so I'm taking those things systematically. But the key thing about generating customer database is it's a byproduct of my normal activity. But like if I spend five minutes on the phone with a customer, while I'm filling out his purchase, I'm also updating his database. Those things are happening simultaneously. So how much is the normal expense of doing a selling transaction and how much is the extra part of creating the value of the customer database? And you can't separate them. They are creating the value of the database is a byproduct of your normal business activity. And that's why I think when they say, et cetera, that they mean what these things have in common is they are byproducts of normal business activity. So brands certainly are. I mean, like again, the Coca-Cola example, you do a whole bunch of advertising. Incidentally, you are also creating or increasing the value of the Coca-Cola brand, but it's a byproduct for your normal business activity. It's hard to say how much of your advertising is driving sales and how much is building the brand, right? So, the reason there that you cannot distinguish the value of creating these from just running the business day to day as a whole. So that's the reason why internally generated intangibles generally cannot be recorded. But there's going to be exception for research and development. So let me jump back to what I jumped over earlier. So we're going to focus on R&D. Now, remember what I said, in the US, R&D are never assets, so they're always expense. In the international standards, however, there's a difference. And without going through all this blah, 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 and reading everything on the slide, um, 
Oh, it's a weird order there. Okay. If you internally generate, if you do research and development, what's the key difference between research and development? And politicians don't get this because they say universities should get, should do co-research with commerce, which is bullshit because the whole point about research is it has no commercial outcome directly. Research is the search for knowledge in general. So sequencing a genome might be research. Applying that to create a vaccine is something different. That's development. That's the thing with the commercial outcome. Now, research might be necessary for doing development, but research is basically taking pot shots in the dark. You try a hundred things and one of them might work out or none of them might work out. So research is too vague to say it's got a commercial outcome. It might be necessary. And if you think about how pharmaceutical companies do research, they spend, a, you know, the reason they end up charging quite a bit for their, their products is they spend a lot of time doing research and many of those research projects don't work out. They either have no outcome or they have an outcome, but it's not commercial. <clears throat> now, there might be some social justice issues there, but we're not, we're not getting into that today. So you might do a lot of research, you have some findings, but those findings aren't commercially applicable. So the basic reason why AASB138 AASB says um, research cannot be an asset is because generally you cannot demonstrate that an intangible asset exists that will generate probable future economic benefits. There's no direct commercial link. Now, you can think of examples. Um, an example might be the Heart Research Institute that used to be associated with the University of Sydney. Um, <clears throat> University of Sydney stuck around some of their researchers and a whole bunch of researchers left from the Heart Research Institute. Now, all the notes of their research were, they were valuable, but they belonged to the University of Sydney but they were pretty valueless for the University of Sydney given the most of the researchers left. So the University of Sydney was actually able to sell access to those lecture notes for the new institution that hired those researchers. So, you know, there will be exceptions where research might have a value. As a general rule in a commercial business, it does not. <coughs> oh, sorry. So we talked about research. What about development? Well, Development is different because development generally relates to developing a product or procedure, right? And if you're seeking to get, if, if you think development's gonna have a commercial outcome, then it could potentially be an asset, but you've got to demonstrate a number of things in order for you to be able to record it as an asset, right? Now look at these things, technical feasibility, intention to complete. So you're actually thinking to finish it ability to use it or sell it. Um, so commercial feasibility, if you like. You, you demonstrate how the intangible asset will generate future economic benefits. You've got the resources that enable you to complete it. So commercial feasibility, again, and you're able to measure the cost attributable during development. Now, this seems, seems like there's a lot of paperwork here, right? You've got to demonstrate all this stuff in order to record development as an asset. But this is not accounting introducing red tape. Think about how you do a development project in a company. If you want to spend money, if you want to budget on doing something, you have to demonstrate to your manager that this has got some sort of outcome, right? So all of this technical feasibility, the planning, all of this stuff would have been done internally in order to start a development project. So it's not as if this is new information that the accounting standard requires. You know, this information would have been generated internally to start the development project. So as a consequence, if you've got it, you can potentially recognize a development asset. The one thing that, let me see if I've got more slides on this. I don't. So the one thing that restricts your ability to record development is this last one, the ability to measure cost attributable during development. So let, let me give you two examples of, of where you can attribute and where you can't. Um, 
let's say that you've got a novel writing unit, right? You're writing books for the market. And in each novel, and in the novel writing unit, you have a bunch of rooms. In each room, there is an author. The author is given a computer, given, you know, silence. And every day, three times a day, you stick some food under the door, he gets food, you pay him a salary, but he's in there writing his novel. You could quite clearly say, because all he's doing is he's writing the novel, you quite clearly say that we can attribute certain costs to him. The cost of the food, the cost of the room, the cost of conditioning, it, air conditioning it, the electricity, uh, the paper that you're giving him if he's choosing to write on paper. All of those things can be clearly attributed to the development task. But the general manager who's just hanging around managing the unit, you know, if they don't actually do any writing themselves, you can't attribute any of those things to the development task. So that has to be expensed. So basically, you've got to be able to track costs, right? We're talking about reliable measurement. So you've got to be able to track costs to the things that you're doing. Okay. And the other thing about development, if you look at the standard, there's, there's a, an immediate impairment test. You're not allowed to record a de development asset at more than what you expect to get from it. Plus, it's really conservative. Um, Charlie said, would a pharmaceutical company that was tasked with vaccine supply include R&D in the financials? Yes, it would, but the research would never be, in, never be an asset and the development would only be an asset if it met these criteria. So it would be in the financial statements, but more, most of it would probably be over on the expense side. And actually, that leads me to, to a point about when you can recognise um, the asset. So let's say you're doing development over, say, a three-year period. At the end of year one, you've, you've trialled some you know, different types of beer, for example, and you're doing some taste tests with customers, and you still don't know which different beer, I'm not a beer drinker, I'm more a wine drinker, but um, you still don't know which beer is commercially feasible. If you cannot demonstrate all of these components, if you can't demonstrate an ability to use or sell at the end of year one, then you cannot recognize that as an asset, okay? You can only recognize it as an asset as soon as you can demonstrate benefits. So you might be doing some work in year one, you can't demonstrate an asset at the end of year one. Doing some work in year two, can't demonstrate an asset then. Doing some work in year three, at the end of year three, you say, ah, this thing is saleable. We can recognize an asset. How much can you recognize as an asset? You can only decide about the spending you've done this year. You can't go back and take the debits from previous years, which were expensed, and bring them at, into asset, right? They're gone, too bad. At that stage, you could not associate a benefit with them. So recording development as an asset is actually really conservative. Now, sorry. So goodwill, internally generated, can't be recognized as an asset. Research can't, brand names, etc. Those byproduct things can't. Brand names, customer databases. Development might be able to. Now, important thing for you to understand is almost never are you going to see an asset called development asset unless a company is trying to hide its commercial advantage and, and what it's really developing. So generally, once it's developed, it's going to be it's going to be described on the balance sheet more sensibly. Um, this is a recipe or this is um, copyright rules that you, you, you've written novels of the rights to a copyright, the rights to royalties, um, you've generated some music. So it's going to be described more sensibly. So development is a process, it's not necessarily the name of the asset. So just to sum that up, internally generated intangibles can only be recognised if they meet the development criteria. And only from the time that you start meeting those criteria can you recognise the cost. So it includes all directly attributable costs, but not indirect costs. So let's go back to the standard for a second. Oh, did I close it? Um, control J. Okay, so uh, paragraph 66, I think.
Okay, so the things that you can include, the cost of an internally generated engagement includes all directly attributable costs. Cost of materials or services, employee benefits, fees to let register a right, um, amortizations of patents and licenses that are used to generate the intangible asset. What does that mean? Let's say you're designing something and you're using some CAD software, computer aided design software. If you paid license fee or you purchased a, a license that's depreciating um, for, to help you um, generate that, then part of the amortized cost of that software could actually be included as part of development cost. So they're the potential costs. Things that you can't, a general cost of the business. Right, and I think this is an example of 65. Um, look, the cool thing about the standards these days is they have some examples. So feel free to have a look at that. I mean, they don't use dollars, they always talk about CU, currency units. They're not blocks of copper for any of you who've played D&D. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so what do we do with measurement afterwards? Once you know what you've recognised, so you've recognised intangibles that you've purchased, or you've recognised internally generated ones only if they've come out of the out of the development process. Now, what do you do afterwards? Remember, I said last time, your the principles here are the same as for physical assets. So, amortisation, which is just depreciation. Uh, my mum was an accountant in Poland, and amortisation and depreciation were the same word. They just say amortisatia. In English, generally, we use amortisation. Uh, for non-physical things and depreciation for physical things. Uh, but these days, most people call both of them depreciation. So don't worry too much about the word. It's the same as depreciation. Um, do we do impairment testing? Yes. Do we do revaluation? Potentially, yes. Right. So the principles are the same. The practice is where it gets different. <clears throat> so do we amortise or depreciate? With an intangible, you need to ask one question first up. Does it have a finite or indefinite life? And for those of you that are English nuts, finite and indefinite are not a paired set of opposites. The opposite of finite is infinite. The opposite of indefinite is definite. Um, unfortunately, accountants write standards, not English majors. So if it's got a finite life, you know what its life is. Um, alternatively, you don't know what it's like, so it's indefinite. You're not sure how long it's going to last. You can only depreciate an asset if it has a finite life. So let's say that somebody says, hey, from 2053, Coca-Cola will be forbidden. You are not allowed to make Coca-Cola. Or alternatively, it's discovered that Coca-Cola causes cancer, and so Coca-Cola company is intending to phase out Coca-Cola. The value of its recipe, certainly. The value of its brand name, possibly, unless it redeploys it, um, will then have a finite life. So if you say this asset has only got 23 years left to run, then you can start depreciating it. But at the moment, you know, things like the Coca-Cola brand name, you can argue it has an indefinite life. It's never going to get used up. It keeps, you know, renewing. So... You don't know how, yeah, I mean, you do know how to do depreciation. Um, and remember, um, you know, if the depreciation goes to making an other asset, then that debit wouldn't go to depreciation expense, it would go to that other asset. Um, don't stress about that yet. We will see an example of that when we look at natural resources. For the moment, you know how to do depreciation journal entries. Um, how much? Well, just use your normal depreciation rule, so I don't need to go over that. Now, what about value change over time? Well, there are two, two ways that values can change. Um, they are either going to be dealt with under the cost model or the revaluation model. So let's look at revaluation first. You are allowed to revalue physical assets, sorry, intangible assets, if you can measure fair value reliably. Let me go find paragraph 81. Okay, so you cannot do a revaluation if there is no active market. Let's see if there's a definition of active market in here anywhere. If there isn't, oh, great. Okay, 
Okay, well, no, they give you an example. Um, so what's this active market thing? The active market thing is, can you reliably measure it if this asset trades? So the problem with most intangibles is they don't. Uh, most intangibles are unique. The Coca-Cola brand, mate, there's only one of those. Um, the Stanmore McDonald's franchise is different from the Ashfield McDonald's franchise. They are unique. You cannot observe an identical asset in the market. Therefore, there is no active market for those types of assets. But there are active markets for some types of assets. The example I always talk about is ta taxi licenses, right? So let's talk about taxi licenses, um, fishing licenses, production quotas. For a while, when we were addressing um, sensibly or whatever, a market solution is usually the most efficient solution to anything you want to do. It doesn't always give you the right social outcome, um, but it's often the, bet, the most efficient way of solving a problem. So if you want a social outcome, try to, achieve, try to design a market. And there's a guy who got a Nobel Prize for market design that gives people incentives to give outcomes that society wants. Anyway, that's a bit of an extract, a bit of a rant out of left field. Um, the issue with taxi licenses is a Sydney taxi license is, un, is identical to every other Sydney taxi license. It allows you to do exactly the same thing. It allows you to pick up a customer anywhere in the Sydney taxi license area and take them anywhere they want to go. Right, you have a separate registration for the car, blah, blah, blah. The taxi license is just the right to pick up a customer in a taxi in that area. So every Sydney taxi license gives you the same set of rights. That means they are identical. And there is an active market for taxi license. Pe people do trade these, right? They don't trade it on the securities exchange, but they are traded through business brokers. So if you're interested in buying a Sydney taxi license, you can get a quote, you know, you can make a call now and get a quote by the end of the day, right? So there is an active market and you can, you can price those. Same for production quotas, carbon credits when we add them, fishing license and other things. So read paragraph 78 because it talks about where you have active markets and where you can't, okay? So if there's an active market and you can objectively observe a price, revaluation is not a problem, right? And you saw how we did revaluations last time. So a no brainer. So we revalued a fair value. Fair value is defined from AASB 13, right? So there's three levels of fair value. It's basically meant to, both three levels of fair value are meant to give you an idea of what is market price? Or if there isn't a market price, what would it be if you could see it? Clearly though, given we've got to have an active market, all of the fair values are going to be level one fair values, directly observable. Because if there's no active market for this asset, which is what you'd need for a level two fair value, um, you're not allowed to revalue anyway, right? There's got to be an active market for you to revalue. How often? Same rules as for the previous week. So just often enough to make sure the information is relevant. Okay, no brainer. Um, and I don't need to show you how to do a revaluation again because we, we looked at that last time. So now let's look at impairment. Apologies to anyone who's disabled, but I spent two years on crutches, so I think I'm justified to show a walking stick. Actually, that's a blind person stick because it's got a little ball on the end. Okay. So what about impairment? You know how you do impairment, right? There's this impairment, accumulated impairment, there's accumulated amortization. So you know how the asset looks, but how do you do impairment for intangibles? Well, same as the physical ones. Right, you ask the question, is there an indication of impairment? You estimate the recoverable amount, um, and then you do the impairment journal entries. So recall, again, recoverable amount is the higher of fair value, less cost to sell, and the value and use of the asset. I'm going through these a bit more quickly because there's something I want to say specifically um, about impairing these assets um, and about reversal. So you know how to do impairment, you know how to reverse an impairment. Now, goodwill. There's two points I want to make. There's one about reversing goodwill, because we've got a blank slide, so that'll give me a chance to talk about it. First thing, you are not 
ever allowed to recognize a reversal of an impairment of goodwill. Remember what goodwill is. Goodwill is that vaguest of all intangibles. So the standard is not really keen on you. The standards are not really keen on you recognizing them. AASB 138 does not cover it, right? So internally generated goodwill, no way you're going to be able to record that. AASB 3 allows you to record it if you purchase it as part of a bundle of assets. Because when you're negotiating a price and the components of that price, clearly you've come up with a reliable measure. So buying it isn't a problem. Impairing it, hey, if the value, now remember, okay, I'm gonna make the second point first. No, I'll make the first point. You are not allowed to reverse an impairment of goodwill, why? When you impair goodwill, you basically said, hey, some of this uncertain value called goodwill has gone away. If you try to reverse the impairment, you would effectively be saying, hey, some of these va this value that has gone away has now come back. In other words, you've created more internally generated goodwill. See the problem? The problem is you're not allowed to recognize internally generated goodwill. But if you were reversing an impairment of internally generated goodwill, that's what you'd be doing. You'd be recognizing internally generated goodwill. And that's a no-no. Right, so you cannot reverse an impairment of goodwill. Right, so that was the first point I wanted to make. The second point I want to make is important because not only does it um, elaborate a little bit on what we're talking about today, but it elaborates on something that we sort of fudge over when we do the property plant and equipment um, class last time. And the issue is the following. Let, let me ask it as a question first. How do you impair goodwill? And the answer is, oh shit, I don't know. Because goodwill certainly doesn't have a fair value. Uh, goodwill certainly doesn't have its own value and use. Goodwill is value that subsists in a bunch of assets that together generate cash flows. And that's the point that, no, speculate, yeah, <laughs> good one. Um, that's the point that I want to make. I want to make the point that in practice, you almost never do impairments for individual assets. Um, if you have a look at, I'm not sure if it's in 138 um, or if it's in AASB 3. I'm just looking for a particular phrase. Okay, brilliant. Um, AASB 3 relates, it talks to 13, it talks about something called cash generating units in AASB 136. So remember 136 is the impairment standard. Um, if, you, if you feel like reading 136, go for it. Um, but the key thing about the way 136 talks about impairment is when you calculate the value in use, you know, an individual machine doesn't really have value in use by itself. Assets as groups of assets have value in use. So this machine with this factory, with the, this other equipment, those together generate cash flows. So when you do impairment testing, even though in some of our examples, we talk about doing at the individual asset level, it's very rarely done at the individual asset level. Okay, exception might be the cross city tunnel, right? Um, generally, you look at small chunks of your business. And they might be, you might be a company that owns a bunch of business. So Woolies owns a liquor business, and owns a few, owns Big W. So you might be looking at those, at those separate business levels, or you might be looking at a separate store level. So you're looking at a bunch of assets together when you do impairment, right? Now I'm gonna just try to draw something here. Actually, I used to have a really cool slide on this, but I haven't taught ASR for a while and I'm not sure where I put that slide. Don't feel like finding it. So let's say you've got a bunch of cash generating units. Actually, let me just do a quick search. Give me a second. If I've got the slide, it will help. Oh. 
Oh, sorry, my machine's going slow. Okay. So let's say you've got a bunch of cash generating units. Oh, now it's good. Okay. Not D. Let me just quickly see if I can find one. When I'm in class, I get to draw on the overhead projector thing, but um, CGU. Oh, that looks good. Um, not my PDF. Um, Emmet. No, I've got some repeat stuff. I can't find it quickly. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, so let's say you've got a bunch of cash generating units. Each of his ca these cash generating units have got some assets and some liabilities. Right. So let's just characterize them. And some of these cash generating units might have some goodwill, right? Because you bought that business separately or that store was part of a business which when you bought it, it had some goodwill. The general rule with impairment is you always impair goodwill first. So if I work out the carrying amount of this cash generating unit, right, the net assets that I've got recorded, and then I say, what's the fair value? So what's the recoverable amount? If the recoverable amount is here, there's no impairment. If the recoverable amount is here, then I must impair goodwill before I impair any other asset. So I'm just going to impair goodwill and nothing else. If the recoverable amount is here, I need to impair all of the goodwill and only once the goodwill is gone, do I allocate the rest of the impairment to other assets. So I either sort of do that proportionately but before I go for proportionately, the first thing I'll probably do is, can I actually identify that any of these assets are particularly impaired? Um, if I can't do that, then I'm going to allocate the remainder of the impairment, right? So impairment, loss, debit, some of the credit's gone to wipe out your goodwill. The rest of the credit's got to go to other assets. You're going to allocate that proportionately to the carrying amount of those other assets. There's a trick here though, if you ever do an exam or you do it in real life. So let's say that I've got an impairment and I've got to allocate it to my other assets. And my other assets are property, plant, and equipment, land, cash, and inventory. Right, if I've got a credit left over from that impairment that I've got to allocate to those assets, it's clear that I cannot impair cash. Right? If I've got a million bucks worth of cash, then I've got a million bucks worth of cash. Cash is what it is. You don't compare cash. So I can't allocate any of the impairment to cash. What about inventory? And what about accounts receivable? Well, it depends. Usually, before you get to impairment, you've already done your adjusting entries for allowance for doubtful debts, and you've done your lower of cost and net realizable value test for inventory. So if you've already done your allowance for doubtful debts, accounts receivable are already impaired, right? They're impaired by the amount of allowance for doubtful debts. So that calculation has been done right. You can't allocate any of that impairment credit to accounts receivable. Similarly for inventory, if you've already done your lower of cost and net, sorry, lower of cost and net realizable value test for inventory, I and mean, that's an impairment test for inventory, isn't it? So you, that's already at its conservative measure. So when you do these impairments of a business unit, of a cash generating unit, you've got to ask the question, have we already looked at inventory and accounts receivable? Because if we have, if we've done the usual adjusting entries for allowance for doubtful debts and for a lower cost and realizable value, then it doesn't make sense to allocate any more impairment to those assets because they're already conservatively measured. So in that case, the remaining impairment credit would get allocated proportionately to the remaining assets. So what did I say we had? Cash, accounts receivable, inventory, land, property, plant, and equipment. 
So that credit would get allocated proportionately to your land and your property plant and equipment. So if your land was 80% of land plus property plant and equipment, land would get 80% of that impairment credit and property plant and equipment would get the remaining 20. I think we might have an example of that in the tube or at least in some of the self studies. So you should see some of that. Um, if not, at some stage, I'll put up a, a past exam because I know that's something we do tend to ask on exams. Okay, look, so apologies. I've almost gone a full hour and a half and I was promising these things would be short. Um, but hopefully I've covered stuff that Peter's already got in some of his little slides. Please, the, the material you need to cover is, the, is Peter's recordings on UTS Online. All I'm doing is giving you a big sort of overall view and here are the things to watch out for. And I've gone into a little bit more detail, uh, but even so, you, if you haven't been watching Peter's videos, they are short, please watch them. They are the key things for this subject. All right, we're done. I shall see some of you in the, yeah, uh, the YouTube ones. I think they're actually on, some of them are links to YouTube. Some of them are, um, are actually in Blackboard itself. So look, basically when you click inside each topic, in fact, let me just call up, what have I got open here? UTS, Blackboard. Um, I always get this when I first log on. Just give me a second. Um, I, no, I only, I'm only gonna take the 1230 tute. And Andrew takes the opportunity. And look, Andrew's good value. You get a lot of value out of Andrew. So in fact, I'd say Andrew's probably more value in the tutes than I am. But, um, so if you go into one of these topics, let's say we're doing assets. Um, yeah, he's got the three weeks all together. Uh, so basically, yeah, some of these are linked to YouTube. Oh yeah, they are YouTube. Sorry, I thought he had some embedded up there. Um, the odd one every now and again might be on. I think they're the same. Some are embedded and some... But yeah, the same video. Yeah, I think so. So anyway, so they're the ones you've got to watch. And really, they're not long. Um, and, and the only negative thing about Peter is sometimes he, he talks a little bit seriously. But hey, that's just Pete. Um, he knows his stuff. I mean, he's been doing this stuff for longer than I have. Okay. All right, guys, we're done. I'll see some of you in the tube. I'll see the rest of you in tomorrow's class when I think we talk about natural resources. Possibly. We'll see. Thanks, Robert. Okay, guys. See you soon. And I'll have the recording for this and the and the slides up as soon as I get the recording, which could take an hour or two. Okay. Stop sharing. See you guys later.